Red Army Women After the War. Fighting at the front was one thing, but what happened to those women when the war ended? How were they met as they came home? Sadly, many of them were not treated as they deserved, and for some, the real tragedy was only just beginning. The extracts that follow are from Svetlana Alexeyevich's Nobel Prize winning book, The Unwomanly Face of War, and from Dmitry Baranov's Facebook page, The Red Army During the Great Patriotic War. Rejection was a reaction experienced by many. I came back to my village with two medals of honour and some decorations. But she could not stay. Daughter dear, I've prepared a bundle for you. Go away. Go away. You have two younger sisters growing up. Who will marry them? Everybody knows you spent four years at the front with men. Tamara, a guard's junior sergeant and medical assistant, was rejected by her mother-in-law. The 7th of June was a happy day. It was my wedding. The unit organised a great feast for us. I had known my husband for a long time. He was a captain, a company commander. We swore to each other if we survived, we'd get married after the war. They gave us a month's leave. We went to Kinishma. To his parents. I went there as a heroine. I never thought a frontline girl could be greeted like that. And suddenly I learned about insults. I hear offensive words. In the evening we sat down for tea. His mother took her son to the kitchen and wept. Who have you married? A frontline girl? You have two sisters. Who will want to marry them now? Picture this. I had a record. I liked it a lot. I played it, and the older sister came and broke it, right in front of me, meaning you have no rights. They destroyed all my photographs from the front. I have no words for that. No words. Olga, a medical assistant in a cavalry squadron, remembered what happened to her friend. Talking of an army paramedic, my friend, I won't give her surname. She could be offended. A military assistant, three times wounded. The war ended. She entered the medical institute. She did not find any of her relatives. She was terribly poor, washed porches at night for a living. But she did not admit to anyone that she was a disabled war veteran and had rights to benefits. She tore up all her documents. I ask, why did you tear them up? She cries, who would take me as a wife? I say, well, well, you certainly did the right thing. She cries even louder. These pieces of paper would be useful to me now. I am seriously ill. And she went on crying. Zinaida, Olga's sister, also a medical assistant in a cavalry squadron, described the consequences of their trauma thus. All the while I lived in Moscow, Probably five years. I couldn't go to the market. I was afraid one of these cripples would recognise me and shout, Why did you pull me out of the fire then? Why did you save me? My sister and I did not become doctors, though that had been our dream before the war. But we had seen so much human suffering, so many deaths. We couldn't imagine seeing more of it again. Even thirty years later, I talked my daughter out of studying medicine. Alexandra, a guards lieutenant pilot, recalls a different kind of problem some women suffered. And the work our armourers did. They had to attach four bombs to the aircraft by hand. That means eight hundred pounds. They did it all night. One plane takes off, another lands. The body reorganised itself so much during the war we weren't women. We didn't have those women's things. Periods. You know. After the war, not all of us could have children. Maria, a sergeant major and armourer, experienced the same problem. Six months later, we were so overworked we ceased to be women. We stopped having. The biological cycle got thrown off. See? Very frightening. It's frightening to think that you will never be a woman again. 
Whilst researching and interviewing the women survivors for her book, Svetlana Alexeyevich observed. What came unexpectedly for me? The fact that they, the women veterans, spoke about love less candidly than about death. There was always this reticence, as if they were protecting themselves, stopping each time at a certain line, guarding it vigilantly. There was an unspoken agreement among them, no further. The curtain fell. I understood what they were protecting themselves against, post-war insults and slander, and there was plenty of it. After the war, they had fight another war, no less terrible than the one they had returned from. Yekaterina, a sergeant rifleman, suffered abuse even from her neighbours. I live in a communal apartment. My neighbours were all married. They insulted me. They taunted me. <laughs> you tell us you hoard around there with men. They used to put vinegar into my pot of boiled potatoes or a tablespoon of salt. <laughs> Clavdia, a sniper, also suffered similar abuse. How did the motherland meet us? I can't speak without sobbing. It was forty years ago, but my cheeks still burn. The men said nothing, but the women. They shouted at us. We know what you did there. You lured our men with your young ugh, army whores, military bitches. They insulted us in all possible ways. The Russian vocabulary is rich. Nina, a sergeant major and nurse, recounted the pain her friend went through. Our battalion commander and nurse, Luba Silina, they loved each other. In one battle, the commander was badly wounded and Luba lightly, just a scratch on the shoulder. He was sent to the rear and she stayed on. She was pregnant and he gave her a letter. Go to my parents. Whatever happens to me, you are my wife and we'll have our son or daughter. Later, Luba wrote to me that his parents didn't accept her and didn't recognize the child and the commander died. Recently, a letter came telling me she had died. Now her son invites me to come and visit her grave. I'd like to go. Antonina, a guards lieutenant and senior pilot, suffered a similar loss after the war. I left my daughter with my mother-in-law, but she soon died. My husband had a sister and she took the child. After the war, she didn't want to give my child back to me. She told me, you can't have a daughter since you abandoned her when she was little and went to war. How can a mother abandon her child? Another Antonina, a Batoshki partisan brigade scout, was traumatized by the screams of a child. My hatred helped me. To this day the scream of a child who has thrown down a well still rings in my ears. Have you ever heard that scream? The child is falling and screaming, screaming as if from somewhere under the ground from the other world. Lyudmila, an underground fighter, felt utterly betrayed by the institutions of the Soviet state. In 1944, on the 13th of February, I was sent off to a fascist hard labour camp, the Croisette Concentration Camp. On the day of the Paris Commune, the French organised our escape. I left and joined the Marquis. I was awarded the French Order of the Cuy de Guerre. After the war, I came back home. I arrived in Minsk, but my husband wasn't home. My husband had been arrested by the NKVD. He was in prison. Your husband is a traitor. But my husband and I worked in the underground. No, I say, he's a true communist. Silence, French prostitute, silence. He had lived under the occupation, had been captured, had been taken to Germany, had been in a fascist concentration camp. It was all suspicions. 
One question. How did he stay alive? Why didn't he die? Even the dead were under suspicion. Even them. But Stalin didn't trust the people. That was how our motherland repaid us. For our love, for our blood. They, the NKVD, broke one of his ribs, injured his kidney. The fascist, they smashed his skull, broke his arm. He turned grey there, and in 1945 the NKVD made him an invalid for good. I took care of him for years, but I wasn't allowed to say anything against them. He wouldn't hear of it. It was a mistake, that's all. One woman discovered a compassionate side of herself that had a profound effect and likely gave her the strength to deal with the trauma after the war. Near Stalingrad, I am dragging two wounded. I drag one, then leave him to drag the other one, then back to him. And so I pull them in turn, going like this all the way long, because they are very seriously wounded, they cannot be left alone. Both, as it later appeared, have their legs damaged, they are bleeding. Each single minute is precious. And then, as I crawled away from the battle, and there was less smoke, I suddenly discovered that I was dragging one of our tankers, and one German. I was horrified. Our people were dying there, and I was saving a German. I was in panic. Back there in the smoke I couldn't figure it out. I only saw that those men were wounded, screaming. They were both severely burnt, black. They looked the same. And then I saw a foreign medal, a foreign watch, everything alien, the cursed uniform. Now what? I pulled our wounded man and think, should I return for the German or not? I understood that if I leave him he will soon die from loss of blood and I crawled after him. I continued to drag both of them together. This is Stalingrad, the most terrible of battles, the most terrible. A human being can't have mixed feelings when one sees such misery. One can't feel one way for someone and another way for the other. One can only have compassion. Another woman recounted the bitterness of betrayal that so many women felt after their service. Only later did they begin to honour us, the women. Thirty years later, we were invited to meetings. But at first we were hiding. We didn't even wear awards. Men wore them, but women did not. Men were victors, heroes, grooms. They had a war, and they looked at us with completely different eyes. Quite different. I can tell you. Our victory was taken away from us. Victory was not shared with us, and it was insulting, unjust. Yet some memories gave these women great pride within. The first medal for courage. I earned it like this. The battle began, heavy fire. The soldiers were lying down. A command rang out. Forward, for the motherland. But here they lie unmoving. Again the command, and again nothing. Then I took off my hat so that they could see. A girl got up, and they all got up, and we went fighting. Conclusion The use of women by the Red Army proved highly successful, mainly thanks to sincere patriotism which prompted so many women to enlist as volunteers. The most serious obstacle to this success, particularly after the war, were traditional attitudes of men and of those women who did not serve. The war was even harder for Soviet women than it was for men, and yet their accomplishments were not fully recognised at first. Women did not have the same status as men. Sadly, it was not until many years after the war, after many women veterans had passed away, that finally the Red Army women received all the recognition they deserved. And Svetlana Alexeyevich's book is a sad yet powerful testament to what these women went through. Today, these remarkable women, who are still with us, wear their medals with great pride and are recognised and honoured for the service they gave. And so they should be proud, and we should honour them, for we may never see their like again.